Hi, and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. And thank you for attending the Cyberproof webinar, New Approaches to DFIR that can radically change and reduce your time to respond to attacks. Uh, before we get started, uh, there's a couple of uh, housekeeping items in case uh, uh, these uh, webinars are new to you. First of all, if you have any questions, you can type them at any time. Please use uh, the Ask a Question tab located below the player. Um, we'll deal with the questions during a Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Uh, there are some additional resources for you to check out under the Attachments tab. Uh, you can download these items anytime. Um, and at the end of the webinar, please, if you can, if you have time, please take a moment to rate the presentation and provide any feedback uh, using the Rate This tab. Uh, and finally, a recording of this presentation will be available um, shortly after we finish, so feel free to share it with your colleagues. So now, I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest speaker today, Sagi Sandig. He is uh, an analyst, a security analyst at Cyberproof. So, Sagi, please take us away. Hi guys, my name is Sagi. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Depends where are you in the world right now. Uh, I'm a part of the uh, Cyberproof DFIR team. I will briefly introduce myself. Uh, I've been a part of this industry five years uh, currently, starting from the Israeli military back there. I've been uh, also a part of the digital forensics and incident uh, response team. And uh, this is what uh, we are doing here today. Uh, so let's go dive in and uh, start with uh, understanding what we will uh, learn today in uh, our webinar. Uh, first of all, we will understand the differences between incident response events and uh, digital forensics events. Uh, incident response team uh, deal with both of them, but uh, there is a different approach and way of handling uh, those kinds of uh, events, so we will understand the differences. Afterward, we will go uh, step by step and uh, we will overview a live case that uh, we handled uh, in one of uh, our uh, customers, a real case that we dealt with. And also we will understand the fundamental principles uh, of an incident response team as we see it. And uh, of course, the fundamentals uh, of uh, develop developing a detailed timeline and how it's crucial in order to submit a good uh, report. Uh, of course, uh, documenting uh, each stage and uh, we will go over and cover it. Uh, and uh, we are as a part of the MSSP team uh, we're working uh, as a L2 team, so we will cover the importance of the cooperate between the L1 team and L2 team uh, in order to reduce the time uh, of the investigation and make uh, the better uh, output uh, of the investigation. So I will start uh, with this uh, with this image. Uh, sorry for the criminal mindset, but uh, this is uh, the best way to make the comparison between incident forensics and uh, digital forensics, sorry, and incident response. Uh, over the left, uh, we can see uh, incident uh, response event. Uh, the robbers are there in the crime scene making uh, their stuff. They have the ammunition, and uh, there, there is a mess everywhere. Uh, so when we are as a SWAT team, let's say it, uh, <laughs> when we are handling and uh, getting into this crime scene, uh, our focus is to eliminate the threat and uh, to clean up the mess as uh, fast as possible and uh, as accurate as possible. Uh, from the other end, we can see from the right the, the second picture uh, when we are getting into the crime thing after the crime took place. And uh, now we are the forensics examiner. And now we have to understand exactly what happened, who did it, maybe why he did it. And the most important thing is how we can eliminate the threat from the, to the, into the future so it won't uh, come back again. So the different, there is a difference in the approach and also in uh, how we handle those uh, kind of uh, events. So now I will go over a few more differences. In, a foreign, in a incident response, the most important thing is to clean up the network. And from the other end, in forensics, the important is to get the accurate result, even if it will cost a few more hours or in some cases days, the important is to get the accurate results and uh, the accurate, to submit the accurate, the accurate sorry, uh, report. Also, the way of handling is different. In incident response events, we can uh, instruct the customer uh, from remote to start gathering the information and in forensics, uh, investigation is done by a professional authority in the investigation environment. Here in Cyberpoop, we have a specific isolated 
lab environment that we are uh, using for uh, searching and also analyzing uh, the file. Also, the whole process is different. The incident response process is done on, uh, on the whole system, and the investigation uh, uses the methodologies and procedures. And from the other end, forensics, uh, we are going uh, over a file or a collection of files with a specific investigation tool. So there is more place to creativity and uh, more, more place to, to think out of the box and to get uh, the accurate results. So let's uh, go further and to understand the basic principles uh, of incident uh, response. In any situation, the most important thing for an incident response team is to remain calm. The IR forensic examiner, examiner uh, or everyone uh, from the L2 team knows more, from, more than the customer. So if the L2 team is getting nervous, the customer will feel it and uh, feel that the uh, situation uh, went out of control. So it's important to remain calm in order to handle the investigation in the best way. Uh, also, the, the important thing in, in the report that we are submitting to the customer at the end of the investigation is the timeline. The timeline shows us a clear picture that uh, describes exactly what happened uh, with the timeline, we can explain uh, to everybody in the organization exactly what happened and how and, and uh, which, which uh, kind of uh, method of uh, attack took place and when. And we can do and we can explain it to the CEOs and executives and uh, also to the technical guys. So the, the timeline is the most important thing that we will see and find in the, uh, in the final report. Also, it's important to document uh, each stage of the process, uh, also for the report, uh, but also in some cases we are standing in court at the end, so it's important to have the evidence with us. And we will see it uh, in, in, the next in the next few slides how uh, we manage to use it. Also, uh, it's important as the L2 analyst uh, to receive and uh, work in uh, cooperation with uh, the L1 because it can reduce dramatically the time. Uh, we are, as the L2 team, would like to get from uh, the L1 uh, IP addresses, maybe geo IP, uh, hashes, relevant, relevant uh, file names, and et cetera, et cetera, as, many, uh, as much as, in, as uh, information that we will receive, we can uh, reduce the time of the investigation. So let's uh, go over a use case that uh, we dealt with uh, here in CyberProof. It actually happened to one of our customers. The CEO of uh, the company uh, noticed that her password, uh, that her PC has been accessed. Sorry, not the password. Uh, she found out uh, that somebody used uh, used her ADP credential. ADP system is a system that uh, deals with uh, money, uh, that pays salaries and pays to uh, third-party vendors, and uh, it's a very important asset in an uh, organization and uh, customer that uses uh, this kind of uh, money system. And she found out that somebody tried to withdraw money with their credentials three days in a row. So what they did, they just pull out the hard drive and then ship it uh, to us to check and uh, understand exactly what happened. So first of all, we looked uh, into the event log of the Drives and we found uh, found out that it was corrupted by the attacker. Uh, he was smart uh, to to delete uh, those uh, artifacts. Also, uh, we looked in the OST file, uh, which uh, stored the Outlook uh, history, and we found nothing interesting. We also tried to find uh, found if uh, is there anything interesting in the TeamViewer. In this specific case, the uh, TeamViewer is uh, legitimate because this is the way they implement RDP, but we haven't found something interesting. So at this point, we thought to ourselves that we have to go and think out of the box, because we haven't found something in the traditional, in quotation mark, we haven't found something uh, interesting there. So we started to understand exactly the process and how ADP works. And uh, we found out that ADP works uh, via a web, web uh, interface. So we tried to look into her uh, web browsing history. We asked the CEO which browser she used the most. She said she uses Google Home. Uh, so we checked the Google Home, and we haven't found there also something. Uh, so we thought to ourselves, okay, 
now we have to find something and uh, maybe the attacker was smarter and he tried to use a different uh, browser. So we use this tool, as you can see, it, the browsing history tool, and we browse the root directory. And uh, as you can see here, the, we, we looked for the, for the whole browser that uh, marked there, uh, Google Home, Opera, Safari, etc., etc., in order to create a timeline. So what we found out next, as you can see here in the slide, uh, we look, we understand deeply the process of the AP, and uh, we got from the customer the answer that uh, they use the Active Directory password in order to connect to the ADP system. So we looked to, uh, for the her mail username in order to see uh, where she she can uh, lose her uh, user for the Active Directory, because in, if in this specific case, if the attacker will have her Active Directory credentials, it will also have the credential to the ADP, and then can do whatever it likes. So we found her mail in two places. The first one is El Kulud site. We Google it. Uh, we, used it we used also our CPI team, Cyber Threat Intelligence team, and uh, we haven't found something interesting. But after, as you can see here on the log, we found the spiral base site. So uh, with the, the assistance uh, of uh, our CTI team uh, that done the analysis on the site with the, in the dark and deep net, uh, we found out uh, that uh, it was a phishing campaign that started a few days before the attack took place and ended a few weeks after. Uh, it targeted uh, this, uh, the executives in a big organization, as you can see here on the next slide. Uh, people that are dealing with uh, a lot of money and have the access to a sensitive uh, and uh, crucial uh, services in the organization. So uh, we try to make a connection between the, the, the Spiral Bay campaign and uh, our specific victim, because even if we found something interesting, we have to make the connection in order to create the timeline. So we ask the, the CEO if she managed to log in via Spiralbell site, and the first uh, answer that we got is that she didn't. Uh, she, just, she said that she saw it, but didn't click it, and uh, after she said she clicked it, but she didn't put her password. So in this case, we thought that uh, let's understand exactly what is the process of Spiral Bay. So with our CTI team, uh, we managed to understand that Spiral Bay works like this. As you can see here in the picture, this is the login, uh, of course, the malicious login uh, page. As you can see here on the URL, you can see the, do the done PHP. The done PHP is actually a file uh, that pulls the password from the victim, sends it, it to the attacker, and also logs in legitimately uh, to the to the Office 365, so the victim won't feel like he's uh, a victim at all, and uh, he can browse regularly and using the services and the Office 365 regularly and not changing the password. So the attacker will have the current password and he can use it again and again and again. So at this point, we went back to the logs to find where in the dialog she puts uh, her credential, and we found here you can see uh, in the red mark that uh, the Sparrow Bay logs, and you can see also from the right, the date and time. So we found out that in the log, she did went to this page and continue the dialogue. As you can see uh, below, the dialogue with Sparrow Bay continues. So we, know, we can know for a fact that if she got the login page and continue the dialogue, so, so she definitely for sure gave her credential by mistake maybe to the attacker. So of course we gave them a, we submit the report and we gave them a recommendation. The first one and the most important one that actually uh, can could eliminate uh, this kind of attack is to implement uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, of course, not just uh, on the Office 365, but in every um, asset in the organization. Because even in this case, even if the attacker would have the error credential and he got her username and password, he, he didn't have her phone. So even if he got the, the password, it means nothing because he cannot access to the system and the threat is uh, not uh, real in this case. Uh, also, we gave them the recommendation to create a whitelist 
that based uh, on uh, IP addresses, uh, they can know from uh, which offices they are using the ADP system. Uh, so they create a whitelist. So not everybody in the world can get the access to, the, to their uh, important data. Also, we give them the regular, um, the regular recommendation to harden the machine and also uh, block uh, RDP and change the password regularly. And uh, I think one of the most important, uh, it can sound like a cliche, but it, it's, uh, in this uh, specific case, it's important to raise the awareness level uh, of the employee. Uh, it can reduce dramatically the fraud attacks and the phishing uh, attacks that the organization and customer can, uh, can feel. So let's uh, summarize uh, this uh, use case. In, let's summarize it. Uh, incident response and uh, forensics investigation are different, but a good uh, incident response team must know them uh, well, uh, deeply. They are very connected. A lot of uh, incidents start as an incident response and then goes and turn into a uh, digital forensics, and uh, of course uh, the opposite. Let's give an example. Uh, if we are monitoring uh, our customer services, and then uh, we got an incident uh, in the sim, and we start analyzing uh, the incident, and then we are getting a file or a collection of files, and then we are taking them to analyze. In this, in the, at this point, we are turning the investigation from incident response investigation into a digital forensic investigation. And also we can do it the opposite way. If the customer found out a file and then we send it to us to understand exactly how this file works and we find and, and we found out that the file is actually connecting the, with the C2 server then it turns out into an incident response and uh, we are, get, we are uh, checking the whole system to understand that the, the threat uh, has been eliminated and uh, there is no uh, threat uh, to the network right now. Also, uh, we, as we saw in this case, sometimes it's better to look for the answer by yourself in the architect and not just to trust uh, the victim answers. Uh, it's uh, naturally uh, the answer why is because we are human and we are working with humans and a human gets stressed and nervous and maybe feels guilty about uh, what they did, even if it was uh, by mistake. So it's uh, naturally that a uh, human can lie or uh, just not say the whole truth as it is. Uh, so sometimes it's better to go deep again and uh, cover the, the logs or, the, or every artifact and evidence that you have to understand exactly and to create the accurate timeline as you can in order to submit the accurate report. Uh, also, it's uh, crucial to document uh, each and every evidence and findings, uh, also to create the timeline as, you, as we mentioned before, uh, but also in case that uh, it goes to court. Uh, not just uh, to, to submit the report, the, the, the evidence is important, as you can see here, for a training materia. Uh, if we wouldn't uh, document this, uh, this artifact and if we wouldn't document the whole process that we did, and uh, from uh, it's more than the, just the report, uh, we wouldn't be able to talk about it uh, here today in uh, our webinar. So uh, thank you. Howard, uh, now it's uh, your part. Sure. Thank, thanks, Saggy. That was uh, that was great. Um, got a couple of questions um, from from the audience, so um, let's let's uh, dive into that. Um, the first is um, how how has um, digital forensics uh, in some response uh, practice changed over the last five years or so? Okay. So uh, digital uh, digital forensics and incident response go through changes and uh, response that uh, technology is, uh, is going through changes. Uh, today, in the last few years, many services have migrated over to the cloud rather than being physically on site. So the customer, the attacker, sorry, have to have a different approach uh, in order to get the information that they would like. In parallel, the attackers have become uh, much more sophisticated in their activities, and they are also involved involve many manipulations that actually are driven by humans. Uh, meaning that they are not based on the technology. Cool. Thank you. Um, 
next one. What What are the key challenges of uh, DFIR? What are the things that really challenge you in your day-to-day -day job? That is a that is a great uh, question. Uh, the biggest challenge in uh, DFIR is the uh, lack of evidence. Uh, let's uh, say DFIR uh, forensics uh, case. It's like uh, putting together a picture puzzle. Uh, the more puzzle pieces are missing, the harder it is to figure out exactly what is the picture. So you have to be better in order to handle the, this, this kind of uh, incident. Cool. And um, so, so you, you've spoken a lot about uh, DFIR, you know, in terms of the data operations, but how, how does that fit into uh, the typical security operations center, like a SOC um, and the SOC team? How, how do you interact with uh, other members of the SOC? Mm -hmm. So as we see it, uh, the role of uh, DFIR is to assist the L2 analyst. Uh, after the L1 analyst uh, submit the, uh, the case to the L2, uh, in many cases uh, the L2 analyst may need uh, deep uh, assistance in investigation uh, of the files or uh, even to managing the event. So we are uh, assisting uh, the L2 analyst uh, in everything they need. Okay, great. Um, and one more question. Um, what is the typical time it takes for a forensics investigation, typically? Typically, it can take anywhere from a few hours to a few days. Uh, of course, it depends on the complexity of the event and the quantity of files, the amount of evidence that's uh, available and, uh, and more. Great. And um, let's just see if there's any other questions. Um, no, I don't think there are. Okay, so Saggy, thank you um, for for your insights. Uh, it was great, and um, thank you to all the participants and for joining us today. Um, if you do have a few moments, please uh, feel free to send us uh, some feedback, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.